Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Falsafi from FAFL. Babak is a longtime friend of mine, uh, a great researcher, one of the leaders of the architecture community, who has not so recently moved into server and commercial workloads research. He's been doing it for a long time. He was one of the pioneers porting commercial workloads to uh, architectural measurement and finding out a lot of very important results about how to do memory management, prefetching, uh, performance simulation and methodology in these, uh, these systems and has driven a lot of the thought leadership in the community. And now he's moved into the data centers themselves and is going to be leading some exciting work uh, at IPFL, you know, prototyping data centers and really figuring out how to deal with a lot of the power and the energy issues that we're facing. So this is of huge strategic relevance to Microsoft. Uh, it's great to have you here. I hope that you're, the rest of your day is as good as the first part since you met with Jim. Uh, so we're looking forward to your talk. <laughs> What's that? All right, thanks. Or not. <laughs> uh oh. All right. Don't worry about it. Okay. No, I, yeah. The, my schedule is actually the way it appears on paper, so there was no surprises there. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't sign, so. Now we got it. <laughs> now we got it. Exactly. Right. So, uh, yeah. So thank you very much uh, for coming to this talk. I guess the system is on now because they told me that yeah, it just, will turn just on. Don't worry about I just go ahead. Okay. So, uh, going to talk about uh, you know dark silicon and implications of server design. Most of what I'm going to talk about is uh, some uh, you know, performance evaluation, power evaluation we've done with commercial workloads, and look at uh, chip scalability for, for servers, assuming that the parallelism is already out there, and, and what this means if you, if you have limited power budgets, and what are the implications. So that's what I'm going to present to you, and I'm going to present some uh, you know very high level overview of research we're, we're performing. In this area, and I'll be more than happy to take offline any questions about the specific projects. There, there are a lot of projects, so I'm, I'm just going to give you a sort of high-level view of it. Uh, so, let's see. So, so, you know, this is not news to you guys. You guys have been working on this for several years now, but basically, uh, you know, the, the NART scaling has come to a halt. So, uh, Moore's Law it will, will keep, uh, keep us going for another 10 years in terms of density, but uh, voltages are sort of, you know, leveled off. I'll present some, some results on this. Uh, you know, ITR's projection in 2000 are already off uh, by a factor of two for 2009 uh, in terms of voltages. So this, uh, does this mean an exponential increase in energy usage? And, yeah. Uh, so so I, I just want to relate a, a brief anecdote. When I gave my first talk to Bobak's group at CMU while as a professor there, uh, he managed to give me a question on my very first slide. Oh, really? It was my title okay. slide. So I'm going to okay. talk to you on your second slide. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question on your second slide. Okay. Show you try to be a little bit more courteous. So uh, I guess just my question was, what is your thinking about when more, how long this will continue if Denard scaling has failed? When does when does that mean that more transistors won't be useful? We obviously well, I think that uh, thinking about that a lot internally. Yeah. So there was a lot of discussion at your workshop at Micro. But, uh, I think there is uh, for for ten years. CMOS appears to be still the cheapest technology. Uh, and now beyond that, there, is, there, there are technologies that are emerging that, that are really interesting. It seemed to have energy scalability, perhaps better than CMOS, but, uh, but then they have their own, own bag of problems, reliability and, and yield and all that other stuff. So, so, that, so I think reliability and yield for CMOS are interesting, but right now, I think energy is, is the biggest problem. And, and, and reliability and, and, and yield are sort of related, but they're not the primary concern. So you think we're getting another 10 years of more scale scaling on CMOS? Ten, yeah, well, 10 years, you know, the, 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 gen, you know, the round trip time on, on fabrication uh, processes is, is now three or more years. So 10 years may mean three, you know, nodes, you know. So, uh, yeah, okay. I think we're, we're, good, we're good to go. Uh, so. So this is just a little cartoon from Sun Microsystems. Uh, they did, uh, you know, electrical uh, appliances uh, at in UK households and did an analysis of, you know, how much where, where does the electricity go and 
And you know, they have various form of appliances that get a little bit greener, not a lot. But in fact, there are these two uh, emerging. One is the orange, with, is your ICT, information and communication technology. And then the other one is the sort of consumer electronics that, are, that have easily made up for that difference. And, and it, they, have, they seem to have some exponential trend. Uh, Son claims that, so, so Son claims that a lot of this is just plugging in your cell phones. And if I, you know, I don't know how much you know, I agree with that, but if I, I have two generations of iPhones that I carry with me, the first generation and the 3GS, and my first generation lasts about a week. The 3GS, I can't keep it up even for a day. Uh, even yesterday I was here and I'm paying roaming. Well, I'm not paying, EPFL is paying for it, but, but you know, it, it, you know I, I, I may be using it more often, but in fact, I go through electricity at a speed, I mean, a speed of light. So with what they did with 4G, <laughs> you know, 4G, uh, you know, they made the batteries bigger, they made the display smaller, uh, and, and, but that's not gonna solve, you know, this problem. So, so we're, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be connecting our, our mobile devices all the time, and, and part of it is because they're just, they can't keep up with our usage, and part of it is that the technology, you know, is, is not helping in terms of uh, you know, energy efficiency. So, uh, so this, is, this is a problem for, for these guys. And, you know, cloud computing uh, is, is both a, a result of this trend, but it's also a, a pull from the usage side because, you know, we want universal uh, access to data. And this is a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but, but what this means is that now we're going to, you know, consolidate uh, the data in, in, into these servers. These are some old servers, you know, from, from when, when Jim was actually at Wisconsin, you know, the SGI Origin and Star, Starfire, you know, 10,000. But th those are really good pictures that I have on the web. So uh, this is good in terms of uh, connectivity. It also is good in terms of amortizing energy. Uh, but, but in fact, these things have also hit a, a wall, and you guys know about this, you're working on this, you know, a, a 1,000 square meter data center is about a, a megawatt and a half now. Carbon footprints are something we're not concerned with in Switzerland because we don't burn coal, but this is a problem in the U.S. and China and other, other countries. Uh, so, you know, and then there is this, a lot of publicity from, from uh, the uh, you know, Energy Star report and the Uptime Institute uh, where they show that th this is actually a, a major problem in data centers. And I'm not gonna go too much into that, but uh, if I just plot this all for data centers, uh, this is, the blue line is the Energy Star line, right? Uh, and they only uh, project up to basically 2011, it was a 2007 report, and I just extrapolated that into uh, future years. And then I went, back and I did some calculations based on what they thought voltages were going to be uh, and what the voltages have actually become over since 2007 and which way our voltage is going. And if I redo this silly Excel sheet, uh, and, and these are, you know, these are exaggerated, but this is the trend that you get, right? If we just continue with the way voltage is leveled off, you know, then we're going to have this up, up, upward uh, scalability. And uh, so what lies ahead is, is that CMOS is going to be uh, still the cheapest technology for a few uh, generations, and we need to be able to exploit this. And the way to exploit it is if we can get a couple of orders of magnitude reduction energy. Uh, we need that energy uh, scalability to be able to put these transistors to use. And I think what, what it means is in the short term is lean chips. I know you guys are building uh, uh, ARM-based boards for data centers and at Microsoft Research. And, and we're doing similar things, except that we're actually looking at changing the, the SOC, not, not just at the board level, but also at the chip level. And, and we have a few projects you know, looking at how do you come up with uh, uh, leaner cores, leaner cache hierarchies, leaner on-chip interconnects that would basically deliver the same service uh, for, for a number of important workloads that run on data centers. And in the long term, I think it's gonna be dark silicon, right? So you have a limited power budget, 100 watts, uh, you get this scalability in terms of known transistors, you cannot power it all up. And it doesn't make sense to build homogeneous chips anymore. So now you specialize uh, different parts of your chip to deliver minimal energy for a given task. And the question is what are interesting tasks and there are a few interesting tasks that are out there 
uh, that that we make it makes sense to specialize for. So, uh, just a little shameless plug: we're putting together a center called EchoCloud uh, at at FFL. Uh, we have about uh, ten labs, and CSEM is a, is a research center uh, in Switzerland that works closely with us. And we have a bunch of industrial affiliates: uh, HP, Intel, IBM, and Microsoft. Hopefully, we'll be there soon. Uh, and there are three sort of big areas that we're looking at. One is just focusing on energy uh, at, at a vertical level, right? From, from computing all the way to cooling. And how do you look at energy minimization techniques uh, when you're looking at the entire system, uh, including infrastructure, not just computing? Uh, we have wor a lot of work on data management and use of data. That's another set of projects. It's a theme that's uh, run by Natasa. Uh, and then uh, cloud application services, looking at what are the kind of scalable services that make sense to cloud computing. Uh, we also bridge these three areas together, but they sort of have their own focus uh, at, at each level, in the three levels. And so that's the uh, Echo Cloud Center. Let me tell you a little bit about the kind of studies we've done on where does chip scalability go uh, for servers. Okay, so there's a paper from Google in 07 that showed that, you know, if you divide up where energy goes, you know, processor chips account for 37%, memory accounts for 17%, peripherals for another 30%. And depending on who you ask, these numbers change a little bit. But for the most part, it's sort of divided up into these three parts, right? Uh, and if you look at infrastructure, that's an additional 50% on top of the 100% you spend on computing, right, in a, in a good case. So, these are really important. I'm going to focus on these two for the purpose of this talk. And, and uh, that's not to say that we shouldn't be working on these other areas. We have projects in, in those as well. So just a quick sort of you know, energy 101. Uh, typically in CMOS where we dissipate energy, it's, it's V squared F. V is your supply voltage. F is your frequency. And, and for decades, we were able to reduce this supply voltage. and increase the overall activity in terms of number of transistors. So we doubled the transistors, we, we activated more, you switch more transistors, we reduced this V a little bit and we got all the energy back. Uh, unfortunately that stopped because of leakage, so now we reduce V, uh, we also increase energy again because of leakage. And so we're at a point where we went from 5 volts to 1 volt and we're kind of stuck at 1 volt. Right? So. Um, the nasty thing is it's exponential in area, exponential in temperature. So uh, it's really hard to, to try to continue scaling uh, V. And there are, there, you know, there, are, there are ideas for scaling uh, VDD, and we should pursue those as well. But I don't, I don't think we, we should focus on that. Uh, this is just uh, ITRS curves. So if you go to the ITRS uh, website today and you plot out these voltage curves, this is what you get. So in 2002, they, they gave us projections it, that's business as usual, you know, as, as time, you know, if future uh, fabrication process, we can continue to reduce this supply voltage. Uh, and then in 2004, they quickly corrected that. And, and then they've been correcting ever since, right? So we're sort of now at a factor of two error uh, with respect to 2009. And I think a lot of these, uh, you know, Energy Star report, and a lot of reports, you know, in 2007 is sort of focused on assuming that we continue energy scalability, what's going to happen, right? And, and so this, this you can see, this is just sort of a, a picture that summarizes it all, basically, right? So what we did was we said, okay, um, we have been working on server workloads. We have uh, workloads on transaction processing, decision support system, web system. Uh, for many years, and we, we actually know the behavior of these workloads, uh, they're highly parallelizable for the most part, so we can you know, simply assume that we can continue scaling them in terms of parallelism. If we take uh, some physical characteristics of an existing system, right, and then scale these according to ITRS projections, right, uh, and, and model power and performance across various technology nodes, what's going to happen? Right? And what we end up is, is not surprising, is that we're going to hit a bandwidth wall. Uh, basically, pin uh, bandwidth does not scale with real estate, right? So that's not surprising. Uh, 
fortunately, there's some technologies that are removing this. So if we go to 3D integration and DRAM, uh, we go to better encoding techniques. We can actually scale this a lot better. 3D gives us a lot of bandwidth. It gives orders of magnitude more bandwidth. So that's actually a really uh, promising approach. And when we take those into account, we hit the energy problem. And we hit the energy problem actually fairly soon after that. So what we did was we took a Niagara uh, 2 system, Niagara 2's characteristics, 72% uh, of the die is cores and caches and, and the crossbar interconnect. The rest of it is peripheral logic. We took projections for ITRS for, for voltages across technology nodes. Uh, switching power, active power is modeled uh, based on activity in the cache and activity in the crossbar. And leakage is modeled according to what ITRS projects to be the threshold voltages for a particular technology area and an and a operating temperature. And as far as performance, we have these workloads that are actually fairly simple to model performance for. Because most of the server workloads just do pointer chasing. So building a CPI model based on cache activity is fairly straightforward. And we can show that uh, the cache behavior actually follows a power law uh, in terms of size. It's really, really simple, nice model that, that works for CPI. Uh, the caveat is that it doesn't work for all the workloads, so we're just going to do it for these workloads. These workloads are parallelizable. Uh, emerging cloud workloads will have all sorts of bizarre characteristics, right? People want to move their desktops to the cloud. Uh, Intel says that most of their people, most of their clients today, uh, use their four core parts to do virtualization of workloads that have very low parallelism in them. So, in fact, it doesn't even make sense to go eight, eight core or sixteen core. So, so you know, but but let's assume that these workloads, you know, we can we can solve the parallelism problem at least for the servers, and and for the servers we don't have a CPI model problem because our models work pretty well. And so the question is, assuming these models, what do we get? And I'm going to show you a bunch of graphs that are somewhat complicated, but I'm going to try to explain to you. Uh, hopefully we, 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 we all understand it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a given technology node right, take, uh, at 22 nanometers. I'm going to fix the die area. That's my optimal die area from a yield perspective, right? 330 square, uh, 310 square millimeters. And now I'm going to look at what is it that I can fit on this, you know, based on my Niagara uh, physical characteristics, right? So, why is 310 ideal from a yield perspective? This is what ITRS says for 22 oh, nanometers, right? Okay. So we took, we took all the parameters from ITRS. Uh, you could, I mean, the, the nice thing about the model is that you could actually vary that, and, and the, the, the results don't change that much. Uh, so we can either fit you know, anywhere from one megabyte to 512 megabytes of cache on chip, or we can have about 200 Niagara cores for this particular technology node, okay? And now the area sort of gives us this bound, you know, this is, this is how much we can fit on, on the chip. If, if we reduce the amount of aggregate cache, we get more and more cores. If we run this chip at maximum frequency, and the maximum frequency for this technology node is 10 gigahertz, you get this silly curve, which basically says most of your chip is not used because you can either power up you know, 12 cores or you can power up you know, 50 megabytes, but you can't, in fact, use the rest of the chip. So you have this. So for server workloads, of course, we have this really nice trade off that we can run slower and more parallel. And every time you run slower and more parallel, your throughput actually increases. And the, the optimal performance is somewhere in the middle. But let's try to take advantage of this uh, trade-off. And now we get these beautiful curves. And this does not assume any limitations on bandwidth. So this assumes that if you have all the bandwidth, pin bandwidth in the world, you, you slow down your chip and you can fit more. As you slow down the chip, you fit more and more. And you get these, these colors. And, um, now, if I bring in the bandwidth curves, it, it, it gets really complicated, so I only plot two of them. Okay? So if you just look at the bandwidth constraints, you get these, these lines. For this, for, uh, I have one bandwidth line for one gigahertz, one gigahertz curve, and I have another bandwidth line for a 2.7 gigahertz curve. Right? And you can see that the minute I try to reduce my on-chip cache, 
that I get too much traffic. So the caches are really there to absorb the traffic and, and they help us with the pin management. And in fact, if we didn't have this pin management problem, we wouldn't need the caches. Okay? And um, what, would, what would be the optimal performance? Now I'm changing the graphs on you a little bit and I apologize for that. Let me go back one slide. Yeah. So but this is assuming unre unrealistic reductions in supply voltage, isn't it? This is assuming ITR, you're, are you talking about these different curves? Yeah. Yeah, these are, this is just assuming that if you go in these steps, you know, uh, right. you're, you're for, for a particular technology now. Slowing down the course really only applies if you can scale the supply voltage. If you, so if you scale the frequency, these curves will just sit on top of each other. That's correct. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's actually the, the, the pairs of supply voltage and, and frequency go together for, a, for this particular technology yeah. now. Yeah. So now I'm going to change the, the graph on you a little bit. The x-axis remains the same. And when I change what, on the x-axis, the number of cores are changing as well. So I'm, I'm still, you know, and, and so I, I do that. And I'm looking for optimal performance, right? So if I only look at area, uh, my optimal performance would be this mustard line, this yellow line, right? Uh, as I increase the amount of cash on chip, right? I actually get better performance up to a certain point. And after that, you know, I, I, I increase more cash and I have less cores and my performance drops. So somewhere, you know, my maximum throughput is, is at about 120 uh, speed up as compared to the single core case. And now, if I take into account, if I go and run this at maximum frequency, I get this black line. This is assuming no bandwidth limitations. Uh, if I look at the optimal frequency, I get the gray line. The gray line. So somewhere around here, I, I max out, you know, about 50. And if I look at the bandwidth, I get this blue line here. And the bandwidth is really the limiter for me. I can't sustain all these cores until I get a fair, fair amount of cash. And once I get that amount of cash that, that gives you the bandwidth uh, limitation of interest, then I'm good. And, and somewhere where the bandwidth line and the power line meet is my optimal at 44 cores at 2.67 gigahertz. And this is for a decision support system and for online transaction processing, these curves move a little bit here and there and for web is similar, right? So the trends are similar, the exact optimal performance changes. Uh, and I thought Gabe was going to be here, but, but you know, this is like Gabe's picture, right? Yeah. So, uh, he's, he's at AMD. Oh, he's at AMD. Okay, I didn't know that. Um, so, so basically, I go to 3D, and the idea of 3D is that I keep my uh, you know, processor chip at this level, and then I stack these, uh, these DRAM chips on top. And what that does is that instead of going through the pins, it, 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 I can go through TSVs, and these TSVs are, you know, there are three orders of magnitude more TSVs than the pins. And, and that basically gives me, you know, terabyte per second of bandwidth, right? Uh, and and that, that's good for my curves because now if I plot these curves, um, bandwidth jumps up dramatically. Overall performance goes up. But jam bandwidth jumps up dramatically and basically the only thing that remains is, is this uh, optimal voltage and frequency curve, right? And at that level, I, I got about 144 cores. And look at my caches, they basically go to, to eight megabytes. So I don't need all the caches if I'm just maximizing throughput, right? right but you won't be able to stack your system memory on top of the chip, so you, the capacity is constrained. So, so the, the, that's a good question, and the jury on that is out. But in fact, um, we're, we're, so we have a project only looking at that problem, and uh, it's really hard to tell right now how much you can stack. Uh, LP, Lpita has these eight URAM, eight, eight stacks. In the long term, you need yeah. to do it, but in the next right. three and years. And, and so one of the projects uh, um, you know, we have right now is what is the uh, memory hierarchy organization, yeah. if you want to do this. And that's actually really interesting. Yes? The first people to figure that the caches are there for, for bandwidth and power are, are, are ARM, and that's why they went to fully associative. Are you going fully associative, or, or, or it doesn't change the numbers that much? Well, if you go, um, are you talking about the SRAM on chip or are you talking about the, the DRAM? Well, the ca the caches. They, they catch. They don't do fully. Associative. Yeah, they don't do fully associative. Uh, no, and actually, 
uh, so uh, at this level still, it's, it's really, you know, you're not optimizing for response time. You're optimizing for throughput. So you are incurring more misses. It's just that you have parallelism. And, and that's how you get, you get a throughput back. Uh, at the 3D stack level, we have no idea what the, if, if, if that 3D stack is actually a cache, we don't know what it really looks like. Uh, but that's what we're studying right now, and, and it's getting really interesting. So, so ne you know, next time I come back, I'll, I'll be happy to tell you what that looks like. Yeah. Why do you have, at 144 cores, the speed up is greater than the number of cores? So the baseline is still the previous baseline, which is the 2D case. So the, the 3D actually gives you uh, an improvement over the baseline, and then beyond that, you get this. So now if I plot, if I replot this across technology nodes, and I go back to the 2D system, uh, and I look at now the three uh, workloads that we have. We have uh, web, and decision support, and, and, and online transaction processing. And if I plot across years, uh, my area curve looks like this. This is the number of cores I can, this is again optimal in terms of cores and caches, right? So the num number of cores that I can fit uh, grows this way. Maximum frequency, you know, sort of is, is, is moving at a, at a, a less uh, steeper slope, uh, and that's because of power problems. And if I now go to the optimal voltage, uh, I flatten out because of bandwidth. Right, so so I, I do go up, I scale a little bit, but but bandwidth sort of keeps me from from uh, from scaling any further. If I now add three D to Niagara, things look a lot better, right? So uh, for some of the workloads, I could almost match the area curve. For some of the workloads, I'm still farther away. And remember that this is a sort of exponential scale, a logarithmic scale. So I'm I'm within seventy five percent of the area. So twenty five percent still underutilized. Uh, it turns out that Niagara is actually an overkill, right? So Niagara was, uh, is not necessarily designed in an area efficient way to just handle these particular workloads, right? Uh, if we, we can perhaps go to other type of cores. And if you look at ARM cores, and now we bring in the physical characteristics of the ARM cores, uh, Group of people in Michigan, you know, Trevor Mudge and a bunch of people at ARM uh, published, published a paper in ASPLOS a few years ago where they showed that uh, if you just have simple ARM cores with a very simple interconnect on chip and 3D integration, you can run a web system much more efficiently than, than a conventional server processor. And so now the question is, well, what if we redo this analysis with, with simple cores? And this is, you know, Take this with a grain of salt. We're, we're just doing physical characteristics and plugging it into our old models, okay? Uh, ARM is a 32-bit processor. So if we had a 64-bit version of ARM, it would perhaps be a little bigger than what it is right now. So, but if we do this, if we do this silly exercise, what you'll see is that uh, you can fit a lot more on chip. That's good. But in fact, you flatten out a lot faster. And that's because... The ARM cores are highly efficient in, in a way they use the area, but the rest of the system, the rest of the chip, is still the old architecture from Niagara. So you know, the interconnect and the cache hierarchy and all that stuff, they're not designed to, 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 to take advantage of the, the real estate. So, so the, the moral of the story is that, well, if we're just going to build these things with ARM cores, we should have built them with ARM cores even today. That's what that says. But, but it also says that we really need to look at uh, on-chip hierarchies and interconnects because they don't scale in terms of energy. And that's what keeps these, uh, these curves from going. So long-term, you know, we need to redo the software stack. And, uh, and that's what you guys are working on, I guess. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not surprising that Oracle bought Sun, right? They're, they're selling a transaction processing engine today. And that's all vertical integration. So the future is going to be in vertical integration. And, you know, you're, I was just talking to Summit this morning, you know, your abstraction layers today, the way they work is that, you know, the, you have this layers that are level, you know, and you built software on top of that. In the future, there'll be groups of these layers for particular services that will all be merged together, and your API moves up. 
So you, know, you don't have these nice lines anymore, but you might have these kind of lines that go up and down. Depending on which service, you may go have to have an API that's uh, lower. For some services, you want to cut it up at higher level API so you can vertically integrate the service. Yes? I'm curious your thoughts on if you did all this. Let's say that you radically re-architected all the software and you transform the way that you do caching and you use the most efficient cores you can find. How much better is it? Like, how much, how much, you said at the beginning, you need 100x. Yeah, Are so, so, I'm, so, so we have a project with ARM where we're going to, uh, our estimates for what we're going to get out of the board with the ARM processors is 10x, running Nokia's software stack. Okay? But our estimates include that we're doing 3D integration. We're not just using ARM chips. Okay? 10x what? 10x over uh, what you get from your typical no, sorry. blades today. What's the metric? 10x in energy. Energy prop, yeah. Okay. So, one of the issues we had with uh, Niagara was the interconnect beyond, you know, eight to sixteen cores. What assumptions are made here once you get beyond this? You know, well, so a crossbar, and then you got to go multi-stage and hierarchical. Right. So I'm going to tell you in a couple of slides about where I think the design is going, as far as that, but. In the, in, a, in the analytic model, this is all the last chapter of Nikos Hardavolsa's thesis for Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, assumptions we made there is that the energy uh, characteristics scale with, with the technology node for the crossbar. So we didn't look at, well, what if we now, for a particular technology node, move to another uh, type of topology and another uh, on-chip network. Obviously, this indicates that you, this, is, this is the wrong thing to do. For Niagara, it probably didn't matter as much. But the minute you go to a smaller, more efficient core, then, then these assumptions are no longer the case, that your crossbar just doesn't scale. That's, that's what that says. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I have two answers to that. One of them I have a slide on. The other one I don't have a slide on. Um, the, the short answer is if you want to scale in terms of energy and go to more cores, I'll tell you perhaps what's the right thing to do if you want to do shared memory. Uh, the second answer to it is that what I was giving uh, Samet today is that if you look at where the workloads are going and what Intel is saying, uh, what their customers are buying and doing with their systems, you're going to probably end up with multiple servers on chip that are not even connected. Okay, and, and we have a project working on that. We're going to show you that, you know, how do you build such multi-server chips without any electrical connectivity between them. And what does that mean? Right? So if, that, if, 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 in fact, you divide up your chip uh, into multiple servers, your servers will be four core cr crossbars, eight core crossbars, and that's it. Right? So, so it all depends on, you know, you want to push the shared memory to the limit. We have solutions for that. But most likely, if your workloads are the ones you use today, and those are going to dictate your design, you're going to have multi-server chips. Right, and that's another project. So, um, yeah, so uh, let me tell you a little bit about caches and interconnects and, and then some ideas about dark silicon. So on-chip caches, I'm switching gears now to if you have server workloads and you want scalable on-chip caches, what would they look like? And, and this, is a, this is a work of, uh, uh, this was a thesis of Nikos Hardavellis. I don't know if he interviewed here uh, when he was on, in the market a couple of years ago. But basically, uh, the idea is that you know, in the future, we, the way we scale, we have cores with L1s and we have the L2 tiles. And now the question is, how do you minimize data movement? I mean, you're spending a lot of energy moving data. And, and you know, Bill Daly says it's all about data movement. right? You, you, you waste a lot of energy moving data. So how do you optimize the data placement so you don't have to move as, as much? And uh, we want to, we like to move the data and place it closest to where it's used. So, uh, you know, ideally, if you're, if you if you have a lot of reuse in L2, you want to put the the data closer to the core. And and you know, if if you if it's farther away, it's okay if you don't reuse it as much. But if but then if you reuse it, then you have a problem, right? You you have to pay that uh, that distance. So there's a lot of PhD theses on this, and we're not the first to do this. Uh, ASR from Wisconsin is the latest work on this before us. 
And, and you know, they basically they, they bring a cache block on chip, they flip a coin, and they say, should we replicate or not replicate? And the idea is we have to trade off capacity on chip with latency of looking up. So, so the more we replicate, the, the better it is in terms of latency because we put it close to where we want it, but we lose on capacity. And so that's what ASR tries to do. And we want to have the cake and eat it too. We want to have both optimal capacity and optimal latency. And, and, um, and it turns out that the way you do this is you look at what the, web, uh, the server workloads do. The server workloads need replication for instructions because there's a lot of instruction we use. Uh, some of them have huge instruction footprints, right? If you look at OLTP, Oracle, or, or DB2, uh, they have few megabytes of instruction uh, working sets, and they don't fit in the L1 cache. So we need to take advantage of replication for instructions, and perhaps there is a simple way to do that without having cache coherence. And for the data, it turns out that they spend a lot of time optimizing for reuse in L1. So your primary working sets for all these systems over the years, they've managed to fit them in L1, and in fact, when you go out of L1, your secondary working set is so huge that if you actually try to optimize for a larger on-chip capacity for caches, you lose in terms of latency, right? So data, there's no need for replication. For the most part, there's no need for migration. Just let it be on-chip wherever it is because there's no reuse in L2. Instructions, bring them next to, to where you use them and replicate them. This way, you don't need cache coherence in hardware for your L2 tiles, right? So you just have a static mapping of where these accesses go and you don't have to have cache coherence. And, and this is, we show that in, uh, with our workloads in the design that was published in ISCA a couple of years ago. So um, here is just some terminology, you know, private data accesses are just, I go to my L2 tile and that's it, nobody else accesses this. Shared read only means that multiple cores access the same information in L2, and shared read write means that uh, somebody's writing and somebody's reading, and this, there's communication going on between the two of them. Uh, if you look at the two basic choices out there, you have, pri you have shared caching and private caching. The idea of shared is maximize capacity, place the block in one place on chip, right? Static interleaved, right? So you distribute the blocks across the chip, and there's a static location for every block. Block X is here, block Y is there, right? So you get high effective capacity, but you may place the data far away from yourself. In the case of private is that you go and look up where the data is, and then you copy it into your L2. So you replicate the, the information. And by doing this, you minimize the latency, but you are now sacrificing capacity. And uh, you also need coherence. You need, you need this mechanism that says, look up where the copy is, so I make sure there's only one copy. And, and so how do we get both together? And uh, let me just, I didn't do the animation on this, so I actually don't like animation on text. But anyway, so you have this, uh, you know, this axis where you vary the number of sharers, and, and you look at the type of accesses, uh, read-only and read-write. And if, if you have read-only, you want to replicate, right? Uh, if you have read-write and you don't have a lot of sharers, you want to have private accesses, so that's also migrate. If you have read-write and lots of sharers, you just statically map it in, a sta in, in one location on chip. So, so migrate here, replicate here, and, and share. Right? Static location, replicate for read-only stuff, those are your instructions, and migrate because there's only one user of the block. And most of these prior studies, they just treated the instruction the data the same. They, they never divided up the different access paths of the instruction data. And that, that's, that's actually, for server workloads, that's, that's what the difference is. So we have these workloads, uh, online transaction processing, DSS, scientific application, multi-program spec. And we have a cycle accurate timing model uh, in our simulator, Flexus. And uh, when we now look at this characterization of, of accesses, uh, in fact, we get exactly what we expected, 
right? So, and, you know, and we get a lot of instructions that are highly shared but not written to. Uh, we get some private accesses, and actually, there's, you know, there's a few workloads that benefit from that, like Oracle. And then we get mostly read-write accesses that are shared, that don't need migration, right? So the, the size of the bubble indicates how many of the accesses fall under in the, in the particular category. And now we can sort of look at the, the server apps and the scientific app and the multi-program spec app, right? Scientific and multi-program spec, it's all migrate, right? The scientific workloads, most of the accesses are divided up between uh, the different threads. And you have to talk about lots of data sets. So most of what they're doing is private and every once in a while they share at the boundaries, right? Spec, multi-program spec, this is what people use to design a lot of chip multiprocessors these days. I don't know why in the architecture community. This is a complete waste of time because this is, in fact, the, they have very low traffic patterns and it's all private, right? Because there's no sharing. It's, it's a single threaded app, multi-program. If you look at the server workloads, you see these, these three, you know, the, the classification we're talking about, the migrate private data, uh, lots of read-write, shared data, and then instructions that are, that are replicate. So, you know, they sort of fit this model that we're talking about, right? So you migrate the private data, you, you statically place the shared data, and you replicate the instructions, right? And, and we have some uh, simple hardware mechanism that aggregates uh, the multiple near neighbor L2 tiles for replication for instructions in case they don't fit in one tile. Yes? Sorry, maybe I missed it, but so it seems like there's a spectrum of shared versus private. And what, where do you draw the line to say something is shared versus so, private? Uh, so it's not actually a spectrum because it has this really big bubble in one end. No, no, right? No. Are you talking in general or are you talking about these workloads? Like I share it. I share it. I move the data from you wrote it for the first half of the program and now someone else is using it for the second half of the program. That's a very different sharing model. Right. Than so what, leaving. So I'm just wondering how you classify it. Right. So the way we do it, it was a static. So for the entire execution of the program, if there is one processor that uses that particular address, we call that private. And any other form of block will be shared. So, so it's very that, static. If you made that window a lot narrower, yeah. that, how do you think the bubbles would change? So actually, that, that, those results are in ecosystesis. And in fact, for these workloads, they don't change much, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's really nature of these workloads that you know, you, you know, Oracle has a lot of private mapping because they do a lot of cache movement optimization in software itself. DB2 doesn't, so everything appears as shared. And I'll show you the results on that. Okay, but, but you're right. I can foresee some workloads where there is a trade-off between how you cut off that window and whether something appears as shared. So for our world, it's simple enough that it just one, uh, uh, one time identification classification for the execution is enough. And that makes the system a lot simpler as well. So it depends from the operating system of the compiler? To differentiate between shared and private? So no, we actually do it at, at the operating system level. So we have a little cookie, and I might have a, a slide on that. We have a cookie in the page table that says uh, everything is private at the beginning until somebody else accesses it. At that point, it becomes shared, and that's it. It stays shared. So it's just a very simple one-way finite state machine. OK? So um, yeah, so, so the shared is, if it's shared and it's here and there's no reuse in L2, we just keep it here, just go get it, and next time somebody else wants it, you don't want it, it's okay. Private, we bring it and put it next to the core so you have local access to it, and, and there's, no, there's no need for hardware coherence in your L2 tiles anymore. And, um, and I didn't show you the mechanism for the the cookie in the page table, but if you want, I can I can tell you about it. Okay. If you go back one slide, yeah. And think about some of the earlier work in this space. You know, you can, you know, when when Tim was talking about a spectrum, you can share what we used to call sharing degree. You know, you can have a private L2 where you can just combine it with the L2 next to you. You know, there's there's every sort of granularity. You know, there's, everything is shared and everything is private at two extremes of the spectrum. Yeah. Then you could just bank things by combining different groups of L2s together. 
Yeah, so... Right. Like, I could pair the two up there and treat them as one right. logical L2 right. slice, and then what you get is a little extra latency, but you get a little better balance of the working sets between them, and you have less coherence. Right, you're absolutely right. Uh, for the server workloads, there's no coordination between the operating system and the hardware as to who the next share is. So, so if you're only looking at these workloads and you do a black box study, the next share could be anywhere. So grouping things together doesn't help. Now, you're yeah, absolutely right that you... from a working set perspective. Uh, so remember... balance in working sets. So remember, yes, but that depends on the workload. For these right. workloads, the secondary data working set, for the most part, doesn't fit on chip. Right, so there, there's not a lot of opportunity for sure optimization. Yeah. yeah, however, for instruction working sets, yeah. that's exactly what we do. Right, right. So for for these workloads, the instruction working sets, you want to aggregate the near neighbor yep. tiles to to share, but for data, it doesn't it doesn't work at all. Right. But but you could write your software so that you benefit from that clustering. Yes. So this is throughput oriented, right? Yes. Um, does that make sense in the web scenario where you want a web page to come in quickly? That's a good question. Uh, so Maybe there's a bar somewhere that you have to just hit this latency, and then after that, it's free. you're absolutely right. I mean, you when you you mostly optimize for throughput, but then you have to worry about response time as well. So you optimize for throughput, and then you analyze your response time. But you don't optimize for response time in in, in the case of web. Typically, that's that's what you know my colleagues who who do server software design tell me. Good. It's the same question with online transaction processing. Uh, there are people who say you need to worry about response time when you have, you know, uh, a lot of load in your system. Uh, and then there are those camps who say, well, typically your system is, you know, only you know concerned with throughput. And, and, and the 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 truth is somewhere in the middle. So yes. So this contention, by definition, is shared. So it looks like you made the case worse. If there's contention, yeah. yes. If if there is contention, but these workloads actually are are super optimized for not having lock hotspots or, uh, I mean, this is something we we do these optimizations assuming that for the most part you don't have lock contention, you don't have parallelism, right? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. If if you have a hotspot, then then these trade-offs change a little bit. Uh, let me just make sure I can meet the, the deadline and then we can take the things offline. But if I plot now performance, uh, the performance of, of these various schemes uh, with, with our cycle accurate simulation, and, and here what I do is I group the, the applications, the workloads that want uh, a shared scheme, and then the, here we have the workloads that want a private scheme. And I'm normalizing speed up over the private case, and I now compare against ASR, uh, which is Bradford Beckman's idea of heuristics based on uh, capacity latency trade-off, right? Flipping a coin. Shared is S. Uh, R is our NUCA is ours. Ideal is a full system simulation of, an, of a system that doesn't exist. And this uh, system ideally assumes that you, own, you find everything you need in your local L2. Okay, that's what ideal is. So, you know, we, we plotted this and, and, and you know, actually ASR, we don't get anything out of it. And we spent a year talking to Bradford Beckman about how do we uh, tune these heuristics so that they actually work. And he said, I spent several years tuning the heuristics and this is what I ended up with. And we couldn't reproduce that, but we, we cite him in the paper that we actually work with Bradford Beckman and try to tune these heuristics so we get a good trade-off between capacity and, and latency. Uh, but if you get, if you look at just the difference between shared and private, it's huge, right? Here, you could get uh, up to 30% improvement from just shared caching, and then you go to the, the applications that want private caching, and you get a huge slowdown, right? So you have this, this two types of systems. Oracle has a lot of private private accesses and, and not as much shared access. And, and of course, your spec workloads, you know, want one mostly private accesses. So uh, the red is, is our NUCA, which, which, which tries to approximate the, the two systems, right? In the case of a, uh, a shared scheme, it, it, it does approximate the shared. Sometimes it does worse. Sometimes it actually does better uh, than shared. But it's actually not that far off 
from, from IDEA. It really classifies these three types of accesses and optimizes for its classification, right, for these workloads. Do you know what data is shared in private and private DB2? What's that? Which data is shared in private? So it's all black box, right? We don't, we don't know. We're, just, we're taking the binary and we're running it, right? But if you talk to the Oracle people, from, from what the database people know, uh, they, do, they do a lot of optimizations on data movement uh, in software. So they have these auxiliary, auxiliary data structures where, where they, they try to uh, find ways through software to minimize data movement, minimize coherence on chip, right? And so they use a lot of private caching. Uh, D, DB2 doesn't do this optimization, right? So, so it's basically going to various places and accessing data. Um, so this, is, this was our NUCA and, and sort of looking at data placement. And uh, just giving you a couple of slides on, you know, are there opportunities in the, in the network on chip space? And, uh, you know, Doug knows from trips that uh, network on chip can, uh, can take up a lot of the uh, overall chip energy. And, and this is true for most of the, the chips that are out there, MIT RAW, the Intel SCC. For, for designs, for, for prototypes that we actually have numbers for, 30% is a big chunk of your energy. So uh, if you look at modern NOx, uh, they, they optimize for worst case traffic. Uh, they have virtualization uh, for request response plane for cache coherence protocol. So, so you, you take your physical resources, you divide them up through virtual channels so that you can have a deadlock free cache coherence protocol running on it. Uh, Turns out that when we look at the server workloads and look at the cache coherence traffic, it's actually based on the Arnuka results. Uh, they're highly bimodal. Uh, most of the time, you send a request out there and you get a cache block. And other forms of coherence activity and other forms of traffic where, where your request gets relate to other caches and, and there are other types of messages are going on are fairly rare in, in these uh, workloads. So if we sort of look at a workload-driven approach to designing NOC, what it basically says is that you have these simple packets where you request a cache block and you have this big packet, which is your back, you know, big message, which is your cache block that's coming back. And wouldn't it be nice if your NOC actually reflected that? So we, we, we actually have a design for a NOC, which is a dual router uh, per node design, where the request plane is completely physically separate from the response plane or optimized for the request traffic. The response plane is optimized for uh, response traffic. And we can get rid of the virtual channels altogether. And we no longer need to, you know, there's a lot of hardware we get out of. And if we do this, we can show that for the server workloads, we, we get 30% or 40% improvement in energy for the same performance. Okay? And so this is a completely separate project. And this, this is sort of an overview of what, what it does. So are you sure that if you separate these planes and you have, you, you don't just have cache requests on this network, you have write backs? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, often from an L2 tile, you'll send a request to memory. Right. Depending on your architecture. So you have memory requests and then memory fills and memory write backs. Right. So this is what we have. Yeah. So, so for these workloads, if you actually look at the traffic, um, you know. So I wasn't asking about a, it wasn't a performance question. Okay. It was just that, you know, you could think of, uh, you know, if I have a, an L2 or an L1 NIS, I'm going to have a request the L2, then a request the memory, then I'll have responses come, come back in both places. And yeah. I've got write backs flowing through. So are you sure that you're not going to run into deadlock conditions without virtual channels? Because you've got data going both ways. Well, if you have it, you know, virtual channels just physically separate, the, they, they separate your existing physical resources. If you dedicate physical resources No, that's not for what each, they do. They prioritize traffic as well. Sure. So, so we, do, we implement the priority at the, the router level, but okay. we, we just provide buffers that are dedicated, the buffers that are optimized for a request plane and buffers that are optimized for the, the data plane. I'm just worried that if you don't prioritize responses over write backs, or you know, control messages responding. So write backs are going through a request plane, they're not going through the response plane. 
Right. So in, in your cache coherence protocol, right, it, it, it requests right, that it, going through the narrow request plane. Yeah, they are. And, and for these workloads, the, the, you know, if you look at online transaction processing or web, there's very little write back traffic. Right. And I can show you the data on that. So basically you... I, it, no, I, I, I'm not, again, it's not a performance right. thing. I'm, right. just, I'm just thinking through the deadlock cases. From a deadlock perspective, all your write backs are going through your request plane. And, and their you know, write backs can be, you know, you, you could delay them because they're not on a critical path. Right, if it's a... It's not a delay issue. Okay. I'm just, I'm just thinking about any, if, you, if, you have, if you have a set of messages that, have, that are in the same priority level. Yeah. So they don't get prioritization in terms of buffering. Right. And you get a resource cycle in your graph. You'll have a no, I understand that. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know so, you know that. so you, if you divide them up between the different planes, right, which is what basically what we're doing, and in some cases, you know, you penalize some because the 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 width of the network doesn't match the size of the the, the packet, but but if you if you divide it up, I mean, that's what basically what virtual channels do. No, they, I, they, I understand. Yeah. So so what we're doing was just physically dividing the two networks. We, we could we could take this yeah, offline. No, I'm, just, I'm just not convinced. That, that your physical division still doesn't still completely precludes the possibility of some cycle. So what I'll, I have I have a couple of slides on the the two the protocol transitions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And and I can show you that, uh, but I didn't want to give a talk on this. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you where where those go. Uh, we're you know we have a project with ARM where we're going to build uh, this you know EuroCloud server chip with uh, 3D integration. Uh, and, and the idea is that you know, we use the ARM cores and we figure out how to actually build the on-chip cache hierarchies and an on-chip interconnect and how do we connect it with 3D DRAM. Uh, then the idea is to run Nokia's uh, OV cloud application. So they have a cloud stack on their servers. Everyone's trying to bundle some service with their product. Nokia is doing it too. So we're going to optimize it for, for Nokia's software stack. Um, and then, you know, beyond this design for dark silicon, you know, we have to specialize and we're looking at a lot, you know, we have a bunch of projects looking at what is, it, what is uh, there to specialize, what are the interesting uh, services that we can specialize for. You know, Intel 10 years ago had a version of their X-Scale chip, which was customized for TCP IP. And they show, and Shaker Borkar has a slide on this, so they show that they can get two orders of magnitude reduction in energy for the same performance as a Pentium for the TCP IP stack, right? And so there's a lot of opportunity for this. Uh, if you look at cord scheduling, you know, stuff that Jim did a long time ago, if you look at uh, uh, cord scheduling, web server, database systems, they're self-encapsulated services, right? Uh, in database systems, you have, uh, you have a joint operator, you have the index operator, you have scan, and you could specialize for these. Uh, and this is where you spend most of your time, by the way, when, in, a, in, a, in a query execution engine, right? You could specialize for these and get a lot more out of those transistors with, with the same performance. Uh, opportunities in the OS, you know, there are opportunities in the machine learning level. Uh, you know, everyone is collecting data and they want to figure out what to do with the data. They want to manipulate the data. Data comes in different formats. You have text, you have, you know, video, pictures. And so there are classes of machine learning uh, types of computation uh, that, that have some, you know, at, 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 at some low level have some common denominator. And we could optimize for it. So we're looking, you know, we're, we're working with linguists on machine translation systems where we optimize uh, a vertically integrated service for text. We're working with, with image database people where we're looking at machine learning computations where we optimize for images, right? So there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there. What we don't have is the data. Uh, we can build a data center, but we don't have the data, right? But we could do all kinds of really, you know, interesting uh, types of optimization. And, and, and this is looking, I, actually, I think computer architecture is looking a lot more interesting now than it did in the past 20 years. Um, so that's it. You know, I, I, you know we, CMOS is still cheap. Uh, energy scaling is slowed down. I think we need to build energy-centric systems, and it's time to put the embedded in all forms of computing. And I would be more than happy to, to answer any questions, including uh, the network question. So.
<laughs> so actually, it's right on time because we started five minutes late and we're. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, we actually have the room till till noon. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, so we just have time for, time for a bunch of questions. Even even mine. Yeah. So are there any questions? Yes. It's related to Doug's question. Yes. Where does the forty percent power savings come from? The forty percent power saving comes from taking all the uh, uh, the uh, hardware that goes into implementing a virtual channel, and from the fact that you're wasting a lot of uh, energy in sending these request packets through this maximum size width of a of a packet, right? So so if you look at the dual design, you know you have a 48-bit flit router for the request plane, and you have a 128-bit flit router for the response plane where the cache block comes back. So did you see enough uh, false sharing? Because I, I assume you were using the 4K or 8K pages to mark shared or private? Yeah, yeah they're about uh, Solaris so yeah, okay, optimal. So yeah, this yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, did you notice that a lot of the blocks, you know, maybe they were marked mark shared and should have yeah. been private within a page? Like how much of these? It's a wholesale marking that you're doing for the yeah. entire page. In these workloads, there's very little false sharing and uh, so in, in DB2. The granularity was fine. Yeah. It, it need, I mean, these workloads, are, they're highly optimized. They're very little. I mean, these guys spend you know, decades. I mean, you, you know that because you work with those guys, right? They, they spend decades uh, at the software level optimizing the pattern, the movement of cache blocks. Right? That's what they can do. And they pay you know, uh, expensive programmers to sit down and do it. Right? Uh, they've beaten the crap out of the software right, to the extent. And, and they've done a really good job to make sure that their primary data working set fits in an L1 cache. They've done a really good job of that. Yes? So just following up with Marshall's question though, so, if, so what happens when you're trying to take on some new domain that hasn't had 20 years of smart people pounding on it? Is this still going to be a good, like how much do you lose? And well, you know, it, it, I think the server, the conventional server workloads remain an important part of the game. Uh, what would emerging workloads look like? I have no idea. You know, I, uh, Dan Reed was was giving a talk at FFL in the summer, and he said, Our "Next gen, the fourth generation systems are billion dollar investments." And when I, you know, and I asked him, "So does it make sense to design chips for this?" And he said, "Yeah, absolutely." Right. Uh, so, I would, you know, I would, I would go and and look at these workloads because that's what we have right now for servers, and say. You know, these are important optimizations. What would emerging workloads look like? Uh, you know, you guys know better than I, I mean, not you, but you know, <laughs> I'm guessing you're you're here for a sabbatical. But if you're here, you know, permanently, then you know, you guys know more than anyone else. You know what these things look like, and and we are actually uh, we would like to collaborate with you uh, to find out what are opportunities for optimization. What would that data placement look like for for workloads that you believe are important? Yes. Going off of that, um, it might be interesting to talk later. Like my interest is in See you guys later. Yeah. But um, I guess more on topic for this. Um, if you are going to talk about cloud computing, it seems to be more getting more into the space of, let's say, Python or PHP on the cloud rather than you know, Oracle L1 uh, L2 cache. On You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. So that's what we're looking at now with Nokia. So what? So any. How do, how do the numbers change in this more concrete scenario? So that's basically where you know, we're, I, I don't have anything to offer right now because this is a project I just started with, with ARM and Nokia. Uh, and that's where we're exactly. We're asking those questions. Uh, these kinds, are, like I said, these, are, these will remain important. Right, the Oracle and DB2 and yeah, those guys are I'm, not going to go I'm away. Saying, I'm, right, more of a selfish interest. Right, but but I think that uh, that that's a good question. I mean, it, we we have to look at what do these things look like and uh, what are the kind of optimizations that, that we need. Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly what we want to do. We want to look at the workloads uh, in collaboration with with our affiliates to look we at. Also look at any non HPC parallel uh, benchmarks. Non HPC parallel, yeah, parallel but not this like super optimized HPC stuff. Okay, so so actually, um, since I'm allergic to the name HPC because I come from you know the computer architecture community, uh, if you notice, 
we only have one HPC in a workload here. <laughs> and the rest of these are not HPC. These are uh, you know, server workloads. So this like share nothing parallelism. Like again. Uh, no, actually that's not true. Uh, you know, okay. this, 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 this OLTP, uh, uh, DB2 has shared everything. Uh, Oracle has shared everything. But this is, I would say, data. You just made this argument that databases are super optimized. Yes, they are. To me, that's HPC. They, they no, I, I so for this. yeah. So we have a we have a sort of difference in, in acronyms. For me, HPC is scientific computing. Uh, and and this in academia versus right. that Oracle to me is the same. I'm interested right. again the the Python. Well, so for for your I mean so if if you if if you think that your uh, you know I think the tuning model if you, if you call tuned workloads to HPC, I think that's not going to change for data centers. The, if if the investment is big enough, you're going to sit down and tune it. So so the question remains: Did you look at workloads where this did not happen? No, because actually we, there are no good workloads that are not tuned. Right, so if you look at Splash and Parsec, these are all tuned. Nobody, you know, in, par in the parallel computing work, you know, I, I did my PhD in the 90s, and, and it, there was no such thing as a not tuned parallel workload, right? And, and the, it sort of doesn't make sense to have a not tuned parallel workload. You, you know, you spend time tuning it. You know, I have another project on how do you tune parallel workloads. That's a different thing, right? Uh, and, and system support for tuning. But uh, no, I don't think there are workloads out there that are not tuned. There are workloads out there that are buggy for security research, you know. Yes? On the network on chip, uh, aside from your kind of tool layer fabric, have you looked at ways of just pruning the size of the, the network uh, to match the dark tiles? So um, we actually haven't, so my, you know, presentation on dark silicon is more of a vision of what happens after three generations, right? Of, of we haven't actually done any tar dark silicon research, right? So we only, right now, have been looking at for uh, for a technology node away or two technology nodes away. If you're going to build a mesh, like the kind of mesh that you know the SCC has, right? Uh, and it's going to be for for cache coherent chips because that's what most of the chips are cache coherent right now. What are the optimizations that make sense? Now we haven't looked at what if you have a he you have dark silicon, you have a heterogeneous, and now what will your network look like? There is a lot to learn from the embedded world, right? SCC is is not coherent. Uh, yes, but yeah, that's correct. But but if you look at the the fabric, it 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 is what uh, you know. If you look at SGI systems, you know, uh, fifteen years ago that built. Scalable shared memory, cache coherent shared memory, or if you look at uh, the ASCII machines, you know DARPA it built large scale shared memory. Uh, the fabric looks very similar, right? So it's just a uh, it's just a single router design, optimized for the worst case. And and everyone in the NOC world, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a NOC kind of guy, but most of the NOC people are doing optimizations for this single router design. And in the embedded world, it's all you know ad hoc topologies and optimized for topology and all that stuff. Uh, so this is a, a an optimization for cache coherent homogeneous uh, nodes. Right. That's a very, very good question. So. Yes. Looking through the ITRS, are there any technologies or things you think that ten years from now will kind of save the bacon and get us back on an exponential scaling? Well, like I said, I think if you look at uh, carbon nanotubes uh, and you know nano electronics. Uh, from an energy scalability thing, they look good. They look better than what we have. But, uh, but then they have their own bag of issues. And so as a computer architect and a system designer, you know, I think uh, there is a lot of room to improve CMOS. Uh, so, but you know, there are a lot of people who are looking at uh, how do we build devices with carbon nanotubes, right? So. Yes. When you, when you optimize the system, how much of the transistors or how much of the error is CPU and then uh, various levels of caches? And well, so when you look at um, Niagara, I think I, uh, I sort of pointed that, yeah, in the case of Niagara, 72% uh, of the core is, is useful stuff uh, from a computing perspective, and then another 30% of it is peripheral logic. Uh, if you 
go for these workloads, web, uh, server workloads. And if you go with a 2D system, conventional pins, then typically half of your chip is cache and the other half is coarse. Now, the minute you remove that bandwidth problem, all of a sudden your entire chip becomes coarse. And for the whole system, including the memory, how, how much is it between CPU and, and memory? How much of the energy or how much of? There's an area or energy. Well, I mean, the amount of, uh, we don't foresee the amount of DRAM that you integrate per core change, right, as compared to today. Uh, that's, and, and that is a challenge for 3D, is that can you actually integrate all of this into 3D or not? So, yeah. Any other questions? So I guess these guys know when to turn off the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.